Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Dick Broderson, and today I'm accompanied by our investing mastermind group here for Q3 2021. So, Toby, Jake, Wes, thank you for taking the time to provide value for audience uh, here today. Yeah, I can't wait. So, Jens, um, the first topic here of today, that is to talk about the holy grail of investing. So, Red Dalio is one of the billionaires that we have studied most here on We Study Billionaires. And one thing that has profound impact on how I think about investing was Red Dalio's concept of what he refers to as the holy grail of investing. So in his words, it's 15 to 20 good uncorrelated return streams that will dramatically reduce your risk without reducing your expected returns. And one thing that Dalio highlights is that individual uh, assets within asset class can well, usually about 60% correlated with each other. So even if you're diversified, but it's still in that asset class, perhaps you're not. So this type of thinking is very different than how many people often think about investing. So generally, uh, many investors have the home as the primary asset. And then with any excess capital, they consider um, typically two different investment approaches. I, I know I'm really generalizing here, but you have one who are more active, uh, very often that would be in the stock market where that person would then pick individual stocks, typically in their home country. Uh, and then you have a, a more passive investor who would buy an index fund, but that's also uh, very much in their own, uh, own country and, and typically a market weighted index fund. So that's sort of like the, uh, the premise for the first question here. So uh, if I can throw it out there, perhaps starting with you, Toby, do you apply the holy grade of investing mindset with 15 to 20 good uncorrelated assets and you're already smirking here and you could also say this premise that red Dalio, you know puts up is it's not really valid i know the premise i think is right um that's the general idea that you want as many different uncorrelated return streams as you possibly can so that your savings generally grow over time whatever kind of environment you confront if it's a 70s stagflationary gold running equities getting smashed to pieces, bonds getting smashed to pieces, then you want to have something in that portfolio that's keeping your purchasing power at least up with, uh, you know, with it keeping, it, keeping it flat. And then um, you've got other scenarios where you've got like a late 1990s bull market or the bull market that we've just seen in equities. All of those things are unpredictable. And so it's good to have those return streams. That said... I don't do that because uh, I'm a equity guy, and I've I only run equities, and I just I'm only going to be exposed to equities because uh, I, I I eat my own dog food, so I I'm only invested in the things that I do. So I think it is a very good idea. I think it's probably a better idea. As it's probably more important as you get older and and uh, further into your investment or into your saving um, career. But I think that early on, you know, it's all right to have a little bit more exposure to the things that you think are going to work a little bit better and to concentrate and figure all that sort of stuff out. But probably, uh, Wes is your man for uh, uncor uncorrelated return streams. Yeah, I mean, I might even speak to that because I used to teach portfolio theory back in the day. And I didn't even know what I was telling these poor students. But like, like going back to basic portfolio theory, the, the whole concept like Harry Markowitz and then leading to cap M all the bullshit that follows is that, yeah, you just pull a bunch of uncorrelated stuff together. And even though they may all individually like go all over the place, when you pull them all together, all the randomness goes away and you just make free money. And if you can use leverage, it works even better. But the, the key, there's two key assumptions that everyone learns. One is it requires leverage, right? And then the second one is that when the world blows up, the correlation structure stays the same. But as we've already learned, and people always relearn, is leverage is not stable because when shit hits the fan, you don't have access to it anymore. And also when, you know, SHIT hits the fan is a lot of things that weren't uncorrelated become correlated. So I'm just, now that there, there's really two asset classes, and, you know, Chris Cole, who's uh, Toby's buddy, he always, he's very good at explaining this. It's either your short ball, like you're, you're, you're winning when things are stable, or it's long ball. Like it's losing when things are stable, but when the world blows up, you know, it tends to goes up. So, so I'm a big fan of diversification across two asset classes, uh, short volatility asset class, 
which things that work when the world's doing okay. And then long volatility asset class, which is things that usually don't work, but work pretty well when, you know, the world's on fire is, is how I think about it. So. I'm, uh, I'm coming from live this week from Capital Camp. So I've learned that the only real asset classes are uh, NFTs, blockchain, <laughs> DeFi. Um, everyone is, that's a very popular topic at the moment. So <laughs> um, no, I think that the other part of, um, I totally agree, by the way, with, with what both Toby and Wes said. But um, I think another interesting way to kind of reframe the question is, like, do you really know what you're buying or not? And, um, you know, if you are kind of a know nothing investor and you don't plan on wanting to figure out what you're truly owning, then I think trying to find diversified streams as much as you can makes sense. However, if you are, uh, if you want to sort of understand what you own, the business is, um, or whatever product it is, um, you, I think that then diversification often ends up becoming diversification and um it's a, just a different mindset and a different way to like there's lots of ways to do this game smart it's just you have to sort of match up your personality and what you want to work on with with the particular portfolio and and not trick yourself into thinking you're doing one thing and really you're you know playing a different game yeah and i think you bring up a good point jake because like I mentioned before most people have uh the vast mass majority of the wealth uh in their home and you know that's something they understand that it makes sense and it's a different different standpoint than say redalio where i don't know how many homes he has but you know it, it's probably a very small proportion of his net worth that's tied into his his homes so I, I can definitely agree with that, but if we, if I can throw it over back to you, uh, Tobin, you said you know your your equities uh, only, and you know, I, I think a lot of people uh, feel that way. Perhaps they have their home, but but uh, in, in pure equities, um, I think even Warren Buffett said like he would put like ninety percent in the S and P and then ten percent in, uh, in in treasuries. But are you are you at all worried that we're gonna have a say uh, nineteen twenty nine? And it took 25 years to recoup, you know, that loss, just because your analysis was wrong. Like 25 years is is a huge price to pay for being wrong in opportunity cost. Is that something that that you 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 considered? Yeah, there's there's a huge risk that uh, equities, particularly U.S. equities, are uh, the you know the most overvalued asset class in the world, and um, that the consequence of that overvaluation is a very extended period of, um, you know, I, I think when I look at the S&P 500, if I use that that Hussman method, I know that that's a, you're not allowed to say his name, but I, I like his method for, for valuing the S&P 500. He says, let's assume that over a decade, we go back to um, the long run average valuation and um, you still get the underlying growth, which is about 6% a year and you get dividends on top of that. Where you end up in six year in ten years if you follow that if you follow that method, and at the moment, I, the last time I looked, it was predicting uh, forward returns of about uh, 0.8 percent, and that includes 1.3 percent of dividends. So that's a negative 0.5 percent on the index compounded annually for the next decade. Now, it's been predicting very low returns for a while and none of those have eventuated so you can do what everybody else does and sort of discard those or you can look at the reasons why that has happened and that's largely that the multiples have expanded faster than earnings have grown for a very long period of time now an unusually long period of time and often the so when you get this overvaluation the consequences lower returns and more volatility so yeah i think that's a very real risk and i think it's probably you know pretty good bet that at some point that's exactly what's going to happen. Having said all of that, I think that uh, I'm a value guy. I, I'm looking at individual names, trying to figure out if I can figure out what this thing is going to be worth in five years' time, um, if I can buy it at a price that gives me a reasonable return based on what I assess the risk of that thing over this period of you know five years. And then I'm trying to get some diversification in that portfolio. Um, by having exposure to, I might have exposure to 
uh, precious metals miners. I might have some exposure to some tech companies. I might have some diversification within equities. And I think that, you know, if you look at the way Buffett's got diversification through Berkshire Hathaway, he's achieved that by holding equities. And even though there are periods of time, like he's written about it in the 70s when uh, gold kept up with Berkshire Hathaway, which was, you know, run by the, the world's greatest investor. So you just went and bought the the hunk of metal that he despises so much and it did just as well as, as Berkshire did. That's a pretty good argument for having some diversification to different things. Um, my, my, you know, my own circumstances are a little bit unusual in the sense that I run a fund, I run two funds and uh, they're equity funds and they're exposed to the US mostly. So even though the earnings of those funds are not necessarily derived exclusively from the US. There's pretty good international exposure to those equities, to those earnings. Ultimately, the valuation placed on those is largely going to be driven by, you know, the domicile, which is the US. So I, I, I have to sort of run my portfolio, my personal portfolio, the way that I do because of the circumstances that I mean, I wouldn't necessarily do it that way if I, if I wasn't doing that. But um, to answer the question, yes, I do think that's a very real risk. And yeah, I do think about it a lot. So um, be before, sorry, Jake. I was just going to say that, um, you know, one thing I see a lot is that, um, especially if you happen to get stock options in, in your job, um, I see a lot of people that end up making big bets on one individual company. So not only is your kind of future stream of your income coming from that that company, but the, you know, you get a big equity investment in it through your options. Um, people can get very, very concentrated into one particular company. And I mean, sometimes that is how you could make quite a, quite a big amount of wealth, but you can also take extreme risk. Um, the other thing I would say is that there's, I think people are probably making a lot more interest rate bets than they might realize. Like your house is, you know, if you own your own house is a, is a pretty long duration asset with some leverage on it, like you're, you're making a reasonably high interest rate uh, bet that rates will probably stay low um, if that's a material part of your net worth. Your equity portfolio is probably also, especially the longer term out the cash flows are from, from today, which has kind of been like the winning idea for the last 10 years, um, then you're, you're making kind of an increasingly more of an interest rate bet that rates will stay lower for longer. And I mean, I have no clue as to which way those things go, but I do know that that you are making a bet on that implicitly in in any investment that you're making, and it's something that to really be mindful of and not just totally let it you know be oblivious to it. So over to you there, Wes. Um, assuming that you wanted to diversify away from a market cap weighted, uh, say called global fund, you know, let's just just. Let's say that it's just our, our home country, so we're already global. Uh, yeah. Which investing strategies would you follow or which assets would you add to your portfolio if you bought into this whole grade of investing uh, type of thinking? Um, so, again, going back to like the what's short volatility, what's long volatility, you know, on that short volatility book is, is what are things that do well during normal times? Well, that's your house, that's your human capital, that's your stocks, that's your pretty much everything most people own, right? So within that bucket, you know, I like to own cheap stuff and I like to own more behind them, right? And right now in particular, um, just because I've been in the weeds of it, like value, in my opinion, is evergreen, right? Buy with the margin of safety. Um, so I would not want to buy passive indices right now because if you look at whether it's a US, you know, index, SPY, you know, it's probably got like an operating income yield of 5%, which is crazy. And then international markets, maybe it's 6%. And EM, maybe it's 7 Like all of those are extremely expensive if you just buy the market cap in the seas, uh, which is fine. But if you go into like cheap stock world, you know, in the U.S. market, you could probably get stocks that are still, you know, 10 to 12% EBIT yields or operating income yields. But if you go into dev markets or EM markets, you could get like 15 to 20, right? So, so there's two times as much kind of bang for your buck opportunities in, in the value world out there in international markets. Um, so I just think there's a lot more opportunity. If I'm going to own short volatility, 
i.e. own things that blow up when the world blows up. At least I want to own things with a margin of safety that, you know, I feel have like higher expected returns. So that, that's what I do. Buy cheap stuff in the States and globally, and then buy, we, you know, we like momentum stocks as well. Cause I, you know, I got to hedge against the fact that, you know, maybe value stocks do get burnt to the ground. Um, so I, you know, I just buy cheap stuff and buy winners across the globe for the short volatility book. Um, yeah, value stocks are like a, a smoking, a smoldering pile of rubble at the moment. that you think they can burn down further from there? I mean, I don't think so. But it, as you know, like like I've earned, I've learned enough in lifetime to not believe in only one religion because sometimes a religion is just wrong. Um, and so I just diversify against the religions. Like obviously, I believe in margin of safety. I believe in fundamentals. I believe in free cash flow. I believe cash is king. But I also understand that like Jake's at a conference where they're talking about NFTs and all kinds of crazy bullshit. Um, they have nothing to do with like cash flow and dividends and fundamentals and net present value. So I don't know, maybe we're in a world where, and I get, I think this is crazy, but maybe we're just in a world where people don't care about valuation. They care about flipping it like Ponzi schemes, basically flip something that's shiny now that's going to be even shinier in the future to someone else who wants to buy it at a higher price. Also a valid investment approach. Um, and so I'm with you, Toby. Uh, I, I, that's why I like value, but you know, there's a risk that maybe fundamentals just won't matter for a lot longer than anyone can expect. It, you know, I need to hedge against that basically. Um, So, Jake, let me let me throw it to you. I I always know what what Toby is going to say because he's uh he's an equities only guy, right? So <laughs> he's a broken record. <laughs> he's a broken record. <laughs> Man with a hammer. Right. So, uh, Jake, what would uh, what would you do? Other strategies, or would you have any specific type of asset classes that you would add to your portfolio? <sighs> I mean, I'm kind of drawn more towards um, trying to keep things as simple as possible. So, like, I'm I structure things um, for my clients actually, where it's uh, basically like within. If you're going to need any money within the next five years, we're not going to invest that part of the the portfolio, uh, and anything after that is tends to be equities. I would be open to bonds if I found things that made sense, but it's just. I mean, kind of in my lifetime, well, early in my life, I think there were probably bonds, but I wasn't doing a lot of training uh, as a toddler. Uh, but, but, but for most of my professional life, uh, bonds have seemed to be kind of high priced to me and especially relative to what equities would offer over a, a long-term holding period. So, um, so I tend to end up with kind of a barbell strategy where there's, there's a lot of cash and liquidity for any needs that a client would have in the next five years from that portfolio. And then everything else is eligible for a long-term hold equity type of investment. And that's just the way that uh, makes sense to me and is simple. Um, and so if you have more than five years, let's say until you'd ever need to draw on that portfolio, then like all of it would be theoretically available for, for equity deployment. Um, now we can argue the timing or or not with that cash and <laughs> the pitfalls and that of that but uh but yeah so I, I tend to have a fair amount of cash and not a lot of other more esoteric assets you know it's it's interesting that you you would uh, talk about that jake uh, so i had uh toby on the show here not uh, not too long ago and we talked about having a cash position we talked about inflation and how we how we might think differently about inflation. I don't know. I don't want to put words in in in, in Toby's mouth uh, whenever I'm saying this, but I sure think differently about the opportunity cost than whenever I started. Well, you know, I was I was taught, you know, the church of Buffett and Munger. I'm supposed to have a ton of cash around, and then I, I would then invest whenever that brilliant opportunity came along. Not a lot of brilliant opportunities really came along, and so I kind of also felt I paid a high opportunity cost with with everything we see now, not just in the macro landscape, but just in, just in general. Uh, with the market right now has well you, you already said that you have a fair amount of, of cash like um is that like 10 percent, 30 percent? like and how do you think about inflation when it comes to that uh you know i'm i honestly um 
you know, I, I kind of view it uh, this as a poker game in a lot of ways where the amount of cash I'm holding is like the chips in my stack. And then there's an ante that is, you know, the blind is comes around to me and I have to pay. And that's sort of the inflation. And I've been very, very thankful that the blinds have been low for a long time of this poker game. And I haven't, it hasn't been that painful. Granted, the opportunity cost has been big. Um, but even then, I mean, you're, uh, it's not like value ripped and I didn't. It's not like uh, most of the S&P 500 didn't really do anything. It was only a handful of things that have really done it. And I was not in a place to appreciate those businesses. And so I didn't really deserve to get the gains from those. So there's always going to be things I don't understand. And if those do well, then it's like that shouldn't really bother me. So um, I've just been very, very thankful that the ante of this game has been or, or the blinds have been low and it has not been as painful as it could be period to, to be on the sidelines. And, and the West, how I remember we, we talked about this, you know, some time ago in terms of ETFs and you generally want to be, to be fully invested. How about you, yeah. like in your private portfolio, are you sitting like on a, on a, on a pile of, of cash waiting to deploy it whenever you see yeah. more attractive? Um, assets? So, so to Jake's point, like I, cash is fine. In my opinion, it's a costly insurance vehicle and there's potentially better alternatives out there that achieve the same end state, really. Cause, cause what cash is doing for you is it's creating optionality to be money good when the world's on fire. But the cost is you got to sit in the bank account and you have the opportunity cap cost of capital and inflation, all this other stuff. And so the ideal situation is how would I get access to insurance cheaper? And I'm not saying that there's only one way to do it, but I'm just a huge fan of using like, you know, obviously trend following techniques where, you know, maybe only put down insurance if, if we're in a bad trend. Um, there's a lot of times you can buy like different, like long volatility products in option world where you can find people that, yeah, they're going to have some cost to carry, but it's not that high. But when the world blows up, you actually get you get paid. And so now, you know, it's it's like buying insurance, but um, the insurance premium is not that high. So I'm just a huge fan of trend following in general, like managed futures, which is, you know, specifically trend following managed futures, just straight up long volatility, like owning puts. But smartly, I could see working um, and cash is also fine, too. It's just so I would say you probably want to do like a a mix of all those different things as a ways to kind of counterbalance your, you know, your all in equity book. Um, and so that's what I do personally. I don't have cash sitting around. I got managed futures. I got, I'm not going to mention it, but I, I own this, this fund that does long volatility and I do trend falling. Uh, but for the most part, I'm long and strong, you know, our funds on the equity side, like, like Toby does. So um, I don't, I don't hold cash. Uh, in big quantities. I think the other part that that's important for me is that, um, you know, most of this game for me is trying to control my own psychology. And I really do feel like it's sort of me against myself often. And um, the cash is a way to really help me to stay patient. And, and it, it, it is, there's a comfort to it that um, I think makes me a better investor. And so even if it is not, it's kind of suboptimal, the simplicity of it, like I believe in those things too, Wes. Like, I mean, I think, you know, tail risk funds, things like that, like they make sense to me. Uh, but uh, oftentimes I, I, I'm trying to keep things simple so that my mind can rest at ease and I don't have to like do as many. And then I can really focus on like trying to really understand the businesses. Yeah, that's, I mean, you're doing it the right way. It's 99% mental game one percent what you actually do so if you're controlling the 99 percent, i think you're going the right right method uh 100 so um let's talk about uh let's talk about trend following you just mentioned it there Wes. so to me i i've, I've never invested in anything that was that was trend following but you know I, I read up a bit on it here lately and it's it seems to me to to some extent to fit the bill of the holy grail of investing you know, I, I don't have 15 or 20 different revenue streams. Like it would be, it would be great if that was the case, but that's, that's not the case for me. And I was thinking whether or not trend, trend following would really fall into that bucket because, um, over a long time period, it's not correlated with the, with the stock market. 
um, it follows a lot of different and uncorrelated markets if it's set up right. And yet you can achieve stock, it, uh, stock market like returns and you can, you can invest in smaller funds. You don't need to put in a, down a down payment as you would for your house. Um, but it's, um, and, and one thing that might make this appealing is that perhaps it doesn't matter if we are in the biggest bubble in history. Some people think we are, other people would argue that we're not. But in case we are wrong, um, the, the strategy appeals to me in the sense that uh, you can make money in the direction the market is, is going. Uh, obviously, you would then be very much long right now because of what's happening to more or less all markets right now. So if the stock market would crash tomorrow, you would still see like significant drop in your trend following portfolio. But uh, yeah. you could then make money on the way down whenever that um, trend has shifted. Um, so um, my question is whether or not you considered investing in, in trend following. I have looked at it pretty, um, you know, I looked at, I, I like. I like Chris Cole's version of the world where it, everything's long vol and short vol. As I point out to Cole, when you when you long vol, you still got to figure out which one of the long vol assets you want to be in. It's not quite as simple as that, but he knows that too. He's written some good papers on that. But I, I like the way he thinks about the world. But the other, uh, the, the, tr the idea of trend following is just that, or well, the simplest version when you apply it in an equity world is that when you get that precipitous drop, which you do, which is like the, the tail end of most bears when you get that big gigantic sell off that kind of ends it that you're like magically plucked out and you're hedged through that period and you can you can find lots of examples that work really really well you can run S&P 500 back and use like the simplest versions the 200 day or the 10 month which is the one that everybody recommends and you can see how well that's done apply that same methodology to Japan the beauty of it was that it kept you invested the whole way up the the Japanese um, bubble as it ran up in in the late nineteen sorry in the in the up to nineteen ninety, and then it just plucked you out at the top. And as J Japan was absolutely devastated, uh, you, you survived and you and you've kind of done much much better than anybody else in Japan by following these things. The problem I have found with them is just the the implementation of them is very difficult. And it's not a total um, solution in the sense that you do have these, you know, trend following hasn't been a great strategy over the last, I mean, Wes, can, Wes would know better than I would, but it hasn't been a great strategy over the last sort of short period of time in the market because we've been whipsawed quite a few times as the market goes down, you put the hedge on, market goes back up, your hedge, take it off. And it's just, that's, that's, that's every single trend following strategy that I have a look at Corey Hofstein's um, dashboard where he tracks these things. They also any of these risk managed strategies like buying some vol, trend following, being a value guy, holding cash. Everything has underperformed uh, for the last sort of ten years because the market's been very very strong, and the the harder that you are, lo the longer and uh, harder you've been through this whole period, the uh, the more likely you've outperformed and, and any kind of risk management ha has hurt you. And so it's always at this point where people are like, well, I've been doing this shit for 10 years and now I'm underperforming. I'm going to give it up and I'm just going to be long and strong. I might even get leave it long. And I think that I kind of get the feeling that, you know, and I'm going to buy some other stuff. I'm going to buy NFTs and I'm going to flip those and Bitcoin and sorry, I know you're a Bitcoin guy, but you know, there's a, I, I don't like assets where the, the basis of the valuation is what the next guy pays for it. I like assets where the basis of the valuation is something that I can individually just go and have a look at the underlying business. And then if the mark gets changed tomorrow by 50%, but the underlying business is the same, then even though on paper I'm 50% poorer, I know that the underlying business is still great and that might be a good signal for me to buy some more. So I, I, I approach it like that rather than, I, and I'm, I'm at the point where I just want to simplify my life. I don't want, I don't want vol and I don't want trend following. I don't want other things in there. I'm just trying to get to a, because the, the, I, I'm okay with a 50% drawdown in the market. I'm happy with my investable assets going down by 50% because I get no, I'm not using them for at least 25 years and probably longer than that. That brings up a really good point, Toby. I think, um, you know, a lot of these things are, like Wes said, they're they're kind of insurance products, right? And one of the things that you're sort of insuring against is quotational risk, like having the prices move on you and then you not being able to kind of handle it psychologically uh, and maybe making an unforced error. Well, if you know what you own 
And maybe you have a lot of cash that you feel good about deploying at that time, which sort of softens the blow of watching your other holdings going down, right? Like you can get excited about the new things that you're buying for cheaper. Um, and you can stomach the volatility and the quotational, like you could self-insure that quotational risk. Uh, and I think that's- Both directions too, up as well as down. Yeah, right. So I think that's how I view it is like, I'm, I'm trying to self-insure that risk rather than look for someone else to insure it for me. So if, if I can yeah, yeah. if I can ask you then, uh, Wes. So whenever whenever people are hearing trend following, uh, perhaps yeah. they're thinking uh, which five stocks have you know uh, have spiked here recently. Uh, they should run out and buy that, or like I just want like to debunk any kind of myth. Yeah, yeah. Let me. Um, so, yeah, it's like a lot of things. Like, oh, I'm a value investor. What's that mean? Like, do you own Amazon? You could be a value investor. Like, so it's really important to define what what you mean, which is basically your question. So there's really, there's a million flavors of trend following, and I'll, I'll talk about two that are kind of the most important. Um, the first form of trend following is just long-term trend following for risk management, get out of the way of the car wreck trend following. And that's where the basic idea is, and this is, we've studied this on every asset class that you could possibly get data on, and it works everywhere in some sense where what, what you're gonna do is you look at a risk asset class. If it's in a long-term trend, own it. If it's in a long-term downtrend, get out of the way. That's simple. Why do you do that? Well, almost all left tail events of 50% type drawdowns are gonna occur, obviously in situations where this asset class is in a poor long-term downtrend. And so you can apply that on every single market over every single data set across time. We've done it. We got all kinds of posts about it, but we have a really important post called trend falling, the epitome of no pain, no gain. Because to Toby's point, if you think value investing is hard or momentum investing is hard, how are you going to feel when you're running like a trend fall and equity strategy and you've underperformed for 20 years? Not that great, right? And a lot of times you're in cash while your uncle's like, you know, he's doing high fives on how the s and is up like five times, right? You're going to feel like an idiot. And trend falling is it's just, it is the most painful trade possibly that I've ever found on the planet Earth. Um, but it also is the trade that I have the most confidence in for long-term survival. Follow trends is a good way to survive because by definition, if something's working, you're in it. And if not, you're gotten out of the way. So you, it's really hard to lose your ass, basically, in just general trend falling. That's one form of trend, trend falling. It's very simple. You could apply it on your equity book or whatever. Um, easy to implement, you know, whatever. The other form of trend falling would be things that are, are supposed to deliver what they call crisis alpha. So where the prior, prior form of trend falling, which is just long-term, super simple trend falling is, is for risk management purposes. It's not going to prevent you from losing money. It's just the idea is it may prevent you from losing over half your money and maybe only lose 20 or 30%, but it's just risk management. Crisis alpha trend falling is much more high frequency, usually runs long, short, and goes across like commodity complex, bond complex, and everything else under the sun. Those systems are designed to, in general, on average, you don't do anything. You just get chopped up to death in frictional costs, and you may make a little money, you may lose a little bit of money, but they're designed that when shit hits the fan to actually make money in the stock market, i.e. why they call it crisis alpha. And, and that genre of trend following systems, which is genetically called like managed futures, is you may be daily rebalancing or weekly rebalancing. You're going to use much shorter uh, time window trends, like maybe do like a 100 day look back as opposed to like 250 or 300 day. And, and again, it's just those are designed not to make you money, but just straight up insurance. Right. And they work like you know, we run them. like they go up when the market totally blows up. But the, the problem with those, of course, is you get destroyed in frictional costs. They're super hard to understand. If you don't know what you're doing, like the Jake's point, you probably shouldn't be invested in it. So, so I'm a huge believer in, in managed futures for crisis alpha as well. But I would also am a huge believer in behavior, 
you know, drives everything. If you don't understand what you're getting into, if you don't know why and how it works, you should just put money in cash or bonds and do your diversification that method. Um, but anyways, so those are the two types of trend. Long-term trend following for risk management, keep it simple, stupid. And then, you know, high frequency, more complex, you know, trade a lot uh, trend following that's usually deployed across tons of assets in a long, short context. Also cool, but not for everybody. And, and could you could you provide some numbers if, if you've done some research on it, like uh, how different portfolios have done with, say, uh, trend following taking up five or ten percent of a portfolio, and then also like, perhaps if if you thoughts on should you diversify within trend following if you do allocate say ten percent of your portfolio into into trend following. Yep. So so in general, for like the risk management form of trend following, like let's say you want to own equities, but you don't want to get your face ripped off at some point. Um, Anytime you deploy long-term trend following rules, they don't trigger that much, right? So de facto, you're basically a buy and hold in the asset class, but it's only in, in protection for like extreme events. So usually when you look at those time series, whether it's, you know, Japanese stocks, Australian stocks or whatever, it doesn't really matter. You're going to typically achieve close to the same expected returns with half the drawdown. However, that's just back testing i always tell people listen you're buying insurance um so you probably shouldn't have an expectation that over a long-term cy cycle you're going to get the same expected returns with half the drawdown we say hey you're probably going to get a lot of the the expected returns maybe 80 90 percent of it and yeah you probably will protect against you know the big kahuna drawdown but you're going to be eating massive behavioral pain because of, like the relative performance thing because there are no free lunches so that would be my expectation for like a long-term trend. It's basically buy and hold with an airbag, right? And you're going to probably get half the drawdown with, you know, maybe 80, 90% of the upside. Now on real trend following, like the more high frequency crisis alpha version where you're trading, you know, whole commodity complex, gold, silver, palladium, blah, blah, blah. Like the more complicated kind of managed futures products. Um, those strategies, I would say, are not going to be able to contribute. I mean, they do in a back test sense, but a lot of times that comes from like the, the, the historical benefit of you had to, you put the cash in a T-bill that used to make money. Now they don't make money anymore. Um, my, what I always tell people is I would not expect a high frequency crisis alpha focused managed futures fund to make a lot of money. It's probably going to, if you get flat, that's awesome. But if it provides that insurance where it goes up 10, 20 percent when the world blows up, that's insanely valuable. And if you're not making anything, if you're basically getting insurance and you don't have to pay for it, that's awesome. Um, is, is the best way to kind of think about these things. Now, as far as allocation, what I always tell people is, OK, you got 80 percent of your book in stocks and you're going to do a 5 percent trend following allocation. Well, you know, if 80% of your book is in stocks and they go down 50% and you put 5% in managed futures and you expect it to really do anything, you're just insane. And, and so the, the, the weirdest thing, and I actually personally run my book like this, even though it's totally insane, is managed futures exposure should be a massive component of your book because you need to counterbalance the equity book, right? Because if you're 80% stocks and 20%, let's say you're aggressive managed futures player, you're realistically, you're still, you know, 80%, 90% of your risk is short vol and you have a little bit of protection. But if you really want to truly balance like the chaos, you, you really need to be more like 50, 60% managed futures program and then 50, 60% in equities, but no one does that. Um, so in my opinion, a 5% allocation to trend following or managed futures is just a waste of time. Uh, might as well just put it in cash and just, you know, feel warm and fuzzy. Anyone can understand cash. Like it's, I would say it's either a go big or go home trade. Um, you either believe it and you do it or just hold money in cash and move on. Uh, but that's my personal opinion. There's a lot of implementation uh, with, I think of it like crisis offer. I and uh, I think crisis offer and the sort of, I think that the trend following, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, but the, the trend following that you're sort of talking about that 200 day, using it as a hedge against a big drawdown and then comparing that to something like crisis offer, which is someone who's long vol 
in the futures or the options and they're going to give you on the on the big drawdown it's going to give you the big payoff and you're sort of hoping that they roughly they achieve the same thing the two things to watch out for if you're exposed to that the crisis alpha particularly if you have that big drawdown as Wes points out these things mostly they just break even over long periods of time well that's a good that's a great manager who gets you to break even over time the advantage of it the reason that you do it is that you have that monster drawdown all of a sudden your third pocket appears and it's got a whole lot of money in it but then to take advantage of it you have to be able to get access to that capital and redeploy it long and rebalance your book back to that starting setting and if you can't get there then it hasn't performed its function it's sort of just it's popped up when the market was down and you felt good, but you didn't achieve anything. It didn't get you any further ahead. The The thing with yeah. the, the trend following, the longer term sort of risk managed stuff, the, the, you have to understand what, what the thing is and the imp, you have some implementation risk in that as well in the sense that when the, uh, like a March 2020, I, I don't know what, you know, which ones worked and which ones didn't, but there will be trend following funds that, you know, if they're, if they're a very long term and they're checking in once a month, are we on or off for this month? And there's nothing wrong with that. If you, if you do it more frequently than that, you might find that you, the, the, the challenge is always how much of the, your cost over time, how much of your burning on premium or how much you're burning getting whipsawed versus your payoff. And you have to kind of decide, you may be able to do a 5% allocation, but you got to recognize that, that 5% allocation, so you give it to someone like Mark Spitznagel, Mark Spitznagel is probably going to burn your 5% allocation over, you know, over a month or so, and you might have to re-up again for the next month or two with another 5% allocation because that's what those things do. They've got this extreme uh, positioning that that the premium bleeds off really quickly, and so it goes to, it goes to nothing pretty I think it's more quickly. to like, Two to three percent per year, but per year, yeah. Sorry, Mark, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to suggest it was as high as that. But, but I have seen. I mean, I, I just, I, I've, I've implemented. I've tried to do it. Uh, long vol, you know, vol op- options on futures balanced against a value book. That's a terrible idea because you can have this period of time where both sides of your book are underperforming, and if you don't get the big payoff then you're just burning premium for a decade and you end up with that, you've achieved the same outcome where you're down 50%, but you haven't had the big the big drawdown. I, I, I'm sort of with Wes in the sense that there are no free, lunch, no free lunches. You just have to kind of get comfortable with your own personality and the, the function and implementation of the tools that you're using and recognize what they do and know that there's always a risk that you get, you do all this risk management for a decade and you get to the same point that you would have been being down fifty percent, or you know, underperforming by fifty percent. So, I, 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 all, all of that said, that's kind of why I've gone back to just trying to simplify my life as much as I can. Do we have time for speaking of that third pocket? Do we have time for a, a quick story of the one of the best uh, third pockets I've ever heard? Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> so it, it naturally comes from the goat, uh, Mr. Buffett. It's the depths of 2008 drawdown and everybody's losing their minds, right? The world's coming to end. Warren sells puts, $5 billion worth of puts. He gets the money that second that he can go do whatever he wants with. And those puts, the way they're structured, no collateral required, no European style option. So, and the average duration is 13 and a half years from 2008. So, um, even if the S and P was down, like uh, I think forty percent from there, right? And this is all nominal as well, right? So like three percent inflation alone, and even retained earnings is going to carry you well above probably wherever it is flat for that, you know, ten or fifteen year period. Um, he gets like the cost of capital at that point for him would have been about four percent, and that's in the if the S and P was at forty percent below in thirteen years from two thousand eight. I mean, just one of the absolute all-time amazing third pocket uh, plays that I've ever heard. And he didn't have to pay for it beforehand. Nope. Money in the door that day while prices, you know, were at the best that at least I've probably seen in, in my lifetime. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, one thing I wanted to add here real quick is Toby brought up a genius point that most people forget is if you're going to do diversification, you're going to do crisis alpha, you're going to allocate these long haul things, 
you have to rebalance into the the world of, that you own that blew up. And, and I've noticed this time and time again. People are like, oh, I just own 60% of this, 40% of that, buy and hold. No, it doesn't work like that. Like you need to, the whole point is you got to be able to actively rebalance and take advantage of your third pocket or your cash. And if you're not willing to do that, it's it's an even worse idea. Like I'm sure Jake here, you know, he's got his cash, but he's got a plan and a program and a system that when the world blows up, he's ready to use it. What most people do is they have their crisis alpha, they have their cash, world blows up. Oh, I, I just need to hold that cash. Man. I can't. So, so unless you have a, a plan to actually take action to implement on the whole point of owning crisis alpha, it's also a waste of your time, which is something that Toby brought up, which is hugely insightful and important for to reiterate here. Like it's not buy and hold. You have to actually do stuff when the world's on fire. Otherwise, it's, you know, just go in Vanguard funds. Have a nice life. Um, yeah, Wes is totally right. I mean, having uh, – there's this idea of like a Ulysses contract. And if you remember, Ulysses was uh, this – explorer and and he was sailing this is mythology so it's not a real person but um and he was sail past the sirens and they wanted you know of course their singing would draw the 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 captain of the ship to steer into the rocks and crash right and that's how all the sailors died so what ulysses did was he tied himself to the mast so that he could still hear the sirens but he couldn't turn the ship so you need to probably create some ulysses contracts with yourself about you know if something gets down to this price i'm going to buy it um, I even prefer to do it for myself with like valuations. Like I like this company. If I ever see it at 8x, whatever multiple, uh, I'm I'm going to buy it, right? And I keep track of that. Um, like, and I think that's really like make these plans while you're sober, while there's not headlines filling your uh, mental space, while it's it's quiet and easy to think about it. And don't wait until you're in the heat of the battle. I'm sure Wes, you know that saying about like the more I sweat in peace, the less I bleed in war, right? Like, and I think I'm trying to sweat right now while it's peaceful so that I don't have to worry as much about it. Uh, and I just stick to the plan. I know it's a good plan because I, I put it together while I was sober, right? Um, don't wait until you're in the middle of the shit to, to like come up with, okay, what do we do now? All right. So guys, I think this is a good segue here into the next topic about active and, and passive investing. Uh, emotions, all the things that comes with that. So it seems like these days that there are more active retail trading that, that ever, uh, you know, if we, I, I, let me just, yeah, by uh, start by giving you some stats here. So in 2019, uh, we had 59 million Americans who have accounts, with one of the seven largest brokers. And that number has since surged. Uh, we are at around 96 million, uh, and 20 million of them were just opened, uh, here in 2021. And so if you look at the total trading flow, retail is an all-time high with 40%. So still with all of that being said, we still see uh, passive investing on the rise. Uh, if you look at the S&P 500, 18.5% um, of that uh, is, is held in um, passive uh, ETFs and mutual fund indexes. So um, we've seen what looked to be uh, a, a secular trend for decades. And so even despite this surge in, in retail trading, um, we've seen more money be invested passively. So is that an advantage or a disadvantage? Let me throw it to you, Jake. Um, if uh, if you have a latching, an increasing share of the of the funds being invested passively. And I ask you because you, you pick individual stocks. Yeah, I was just worried I was gonna have to go first. Um, I'm so glad that was you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, a, a couple things, I think, um, I'm very ambivalent about the the rise of um, all the kind of like call it Robin Hood effect for for lack of a better term. Um, on the one hand, I love the idea that young people are investing, uh, you know, taking an interest in owning businesses or um, and like saving money and putting it to use. And uh, I think it's terrific. Uh, I want to encourage that. However, I can't help but feel like uh, a lot of it is uh, resembles gambling, uh, and maybe by design, uh, as far as some of the dopamine hacking that is, that happens. And I find that to be very dis distasteful. So while I, like, I like the idea of the, um, 
encouraging people to invest, the execution of it thus far in a lot of these apps has been, uh, I, I find it to be uh, disappointing. So uh, as far as well, once the money comes in from outside and maybe like less sophisticated uh, is passive or active, um, I think for most people, unless you have a real active interest in wanting to under, like get into this stuff and and kind of live it, um, I think passive is a totally appropriate thing for you to do. Um, now, if you are into it, uh, then I think like it's active is is still very reasonable. Um, and granted, I like this is some motivated reasoning for sure because it's like what I like to do. But um, I, I think they <sighs> so there's like sort of two sides of the debate. Like there's the flow debate, which is like. God, if everyone's going into passive, those they're just buying all of the S and P five hundred, let's say, uh, and that therefore that's the only thing that's going to like ever work and move. And if you're out of, if you're an, an orphaned stock that's not in an index that's getting passive flows, well, good luck to you ever being able to like recognize uh, a good return. I think that that is um, is tr true in the short run, but. The, a total advantage in the long run, uh, and uh, and you, it, you have to have the faith that like what I'm buying today, uh, even though it is an orphan and not part of indexes, uh, the underlying business value is accruing, and the fact that no one is looking at it because they're just all passively indexing is an absolute godsend for an active investor. So, I think that both sides of the debate right now have have framed it as if you know call it uh, you know like kind of Mike Green's melt up uh, theory of that it's just we're just going to keep going up and it's because there's just passive flows all the time. Um, yeah, I think over a short time period, that's absolutely true. But over the long period, uh, you couldn't ask for a better setup as a, as a stock picker, because if, if no one's looking at all of these businesses and no one's bidding them up, like that's my dream come true. So um, I think it's just, again, it's always about coming back to setting like what is appropriate for your psychology, what game are you playing, uh, and then picking the strategy that fits with what you're trying to accomplish and where your strengths and weaknesses are. Toby, do you uh, dare answer that question? Yeah, I'll probably just reiterate what uh, what Jake just said. Uh, I guess that the two questions is passive in the sense that um, you just you you're just investing into an index fund and you've 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 thought about your allocation beforehand and uh you you're getting some exposure to all of the right things you've got your asset mix this that that's that's going to be perfectly fine you've already recognized that there are risks in S&P 500 has a risk of going down 50% at any time uh international stuff's in the same basket the bonds might underperform if uh we get some inflation or interest rates go up there's no just to, to to keep on saying where's his favorite line, but I, I 100% endorse it. There's no free lunch. You're going to be, there's no way to like protect yourself against everything or to underperform or, or to outperform everything. The other, the other argument about, you know, passive distorting the market or destroying the market. I'm with, I'm kind of with Jake on this and I've been saying this for a while that, you know, this scenario is not new. You can find there's a Piper Jaffray article from like 1999 called the Endangered Species List, and they followed up a year later with another one called Darwin's Darlings. Basically, they were just pointing out, hey, look, with all this tech stuff going on, there are all of these Russell 2000 companies. So that's the smallest 2000 of the Russell 3000. And they're, they're, some of the ones at the bottom are pretty small. Look, there are companies that are growing their earnings or revenues like 30% a year, and you can buy them on an EBIT. EV multiple of like five, um, and this is crazy. And I, I, they were just pointing out the fact that this existed, and then from that there was that um, activism and private equity boom in the early two thousands, where they all got taken private or they got approached by activists to have them do some sort of value enhancing maneuver, and then all of the action started happening in those smaller companies. And so, you know, for a period of time, everybody in the market was a was a value guy and an activist. And that did then value did extremely well and it attracted a whole lot of guys, probably like me and probably like Jay too. I don't want to hang you mate, on that one, but I, we talked about it at the time where I was like, oh, value's really, value works all the time and it does really well. All you've got to do is stomach those, uh, the, the tech boom, like late 1990s and they never come around. Very often, here we are in another in another gigantic tech boom with people trying to justify why it's going to go on forever. And I kind of think that 
you know, when there's opportunities out there, you just got to take them, even if even if the market doesn't recognize it for a long period of time afterwards. So it's, I think it's a it's a good thing from a um, from a selfish perspective. Whether it's good for the market as a whole, I don't know. Uh, is that, that's a slightly different question to the Robin Hood question, isn't it? I don't know if we do we get off topic there. <laughs> Uh, um, no, let me, let me uh, throw it over to you here, Wes, because we do have a Robin Hood question here, next one to go. But before we do that, um, I know you're really in the, in the trenches with, with, with your fund. So uh, I'm sure you thought about this question. It's something that I've, you know, is it the advantage or disadvantage to the active investor that we now see this, this secular trend? It looks like it's, it's going to continue. Yeah. I mean, I think in the end, investing boils down to dollars and cents um not whether it's labeled passive or active so the things that matter always matter fees taxes and frictional costs and so e even though the best active strategy might be able to crush the soul of like the worst passive strategy if the fees taxes or frictional costs are managed you still might be better off doing passive right um, so, so that's something we always want to be concerned about on, on any investment approach. What are we doing and what's like the net benefit to it? But I, I certainly agree with, with these folks here. And it's something that, you know, Ben Graham talked about, like, you know, 70 years ago, you know, in the end, it's a weighing machine. Like the facts matter. Like it, it's not a Ponzi scheme. Like at some point, cash flow and actual business matters. Now that it when is that point, Wes? But yeah, yeah. <laughs> when is that? that I'm know, waiting. The market is crazy for another 20 years, but at some point, the weighing machine matters. Um, and so, and and so that's something to consider when, whether you're active or passive. It's not whether it's active or passive. It's what are you buying? And fundamentally, right now, what you're buying when you buy passive is a bunch of extraordinarily expensive, high gross prospect, high sentiment. It's got to be perfect to work investments. If you're cool with that and go for it, if you have horizon, you have discipline, you believe in the weighing machine and you can access the exposure, cheap, efficient, after tax, blah, blah, blah. You know, I personally think that, you know, we're in a situation where the opportunity and active is actually enormous, but the cost of exploiting it is enormous in the form of behavioral problems. Because it, there's very likely that, you know, anyone who tries to, you know, do something cute is going to have to sit for 20 years and look like a total idiot when your five-year-old cousin is like, why don't you just buy NFTs, dude? Um, so, I mean, that, that's the trade-off. Like to Toby's point, there's no free lunch. Um, you get excess returns, but there's usually some either direct or indirect costs associated with exploiting it. So, yeah, I just... I think it's all an age old debate that, you know, people have forever. Um, but the weighing machine matters in the end after fees, after, sorry, excuse me, taxes and frictional costs. So Jens, I, I really look forward to, to asking, uh, this question. Um, uh, so Charlie Munger has said of the commission free trading app, Robinhood. Uh, yes, it is one of those episodes where we're talking about Robinhood. And so he has said, it's a gambling parlor masquerading as a respectable business. So let me just tee up to you. Like, Charlie, tell us how you really feel, right? Uh, Jake, do you agree with, with Charlie? And is there a silver lining? Uh, I mean, I, I tend to, like, directionally probably agree with Charlie. Um, the silver lining, I think, is... Uh, it's it's true, like like Wes just said, like lowering the fees uh, on any product like that is should hopefully leave more meat on the bone for the investor. Uh, now, whether the the hidden fees of front running or whatever it is that that how by selling order flow, what that actually takes a bite out of the the meat that's there for the investor, um, I'm not sure I even know what the answer to that is, and I I'm, I. I don't know how much that skim costs, but, I, and it does feel a little disingenuous to say that it's commission free trades, which, okay, that is true, but it's not free trades. Like those are two different things. So don't say free trades. That's not true. It's commission free trades. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, like I said already, like it's, it's certainly, um, 
and this is my own bias speaking of how I see the world and how I, I want to do this, but um, it, it does encourage a short-term kind of, you know, behavior, I think, um, through, and probably too active of a, of a trading uh, relative to probably what the research would suggest is a good uh, cadence. But, but again, those are, I'm, re I'm revealing my own biases more than, than telling you anything new. Toby? Yeah, it's a modern day version of the bucket shops that were around in Jesse Livermore's day, where you basically you can get access to margin, and you know they've simplified it. So, are you th do you think this is going to go up? Then buy this thing, which is an option, which you know up over yeah up over what period? A week, a month, a year, ten years? Like there are some businesses that I feel reasonably confident will be bigger businesses in five years' time. You know whether that stock price is going to be higher at the end of the quarter or not like I, I the flip a coin i've got no idea and i don't think that there are very many other people who have figured it out either maybe jim simon's figured it out but i don't think there are very many other people who figured out that short-term stuff yeah i don't really like the uh, the way that they set it up to encourage people to over trade because i think that it's people who are in sort of a lot of them are in desperate straits and they're looking for some way out and they're using that as their way out and i think that ultimately they'll probably get hurt and then the silver lining might have been well it's drawn all these people into the market who wouldn't otherwise be in there but if they get burnt really badly you know are they going to come back or are they just gone forever and you know ultimately you're better off viewing it as like a savings vehicle that you save into over time and you get growth in the underlying assets over decades not sort of weeks or months or quarters or even years so yeah I'm, I, I don't want to you know, rain on anybody's parade. If if you're having fun doing it, then then have fun doing it. But just recognize that there there is also a downside and we haven't seen one, you know, since March twenty twenty when a lot of these people have come in post that. So Wes, you don't come off as the stereotype of the person sitting uh on your phone all day trading fourteen days uh options on, on Robin Hood. Uh <laughs> but do you uh because i i see you not there with the, with the criticism of of toby and jake do you, is there anything positive to say about this development we're seeing right now um not really and and the way i saw well kind of so so i usually explain to people like hey investing is 99 percent behavioral one percent operational and on that one percent operational this stuff is amazing right if you're an investor your fees your taxes and your fictional costs are insanely low via you know these brokers etfs what have you however you've had have a huge benefit on the one percent of investing but on the other 99 percent, the behavioral side the costs have been magnified right you can now trade for free you can trade seamlessly anyone can access the information which just encourages decision making and activity and so i think on net it, it's probably going to be the most painful, atrocious, money losing exercise that, you know, a lot of people will ever go through for the rest of their life. Um, unfortunately, but it like to Toby's point, it'd be a good lesson. I used to do that. I used to gamble all the time, lost my ass. And now I learned not to do that. So, um, everyone's got to like touch the flame sometime. And I encourage people to do that when they're young and kind of broke because, you know, if you get, some resources you don't want to start doing that uh because then you lose the whole kitty so you know there's costs and benefits to everything basically i think one of the reasons that uh that real estate has been a, a traditionally a pretty good wealth building uh, vehicle for a lot of people is that because the transaction costs are so high and it's hard to get in and out of uh and you know i think for the the average person who they can make their mortgage payment and it turns into sort of a forced savings vehicle then like they basically you know borrow three hundred thousand dollars and then pay it back over time and you get three hundred thousand dollars at the end um so you know this is very much the opposite of that uh, but yeah i mean like you said if you're if you're diligent and like i i, I view that i'm building my my little empire every single day and like the fact that i can create and tear down my empire and whatever the image is in my head of what it should look like for almost zero cost anytime i want to do it is an absolute amazing thing for an investor but like any tool it can be used for good or for or not evil but for 
um, you're not for your benefit. Uh, and so you just have to be very careful, just like a, you know, you wouldn't give a scalpel to a two year old. Cause like, sure. Like we do surgeries with scalpels, but you could also disfigure something. Uh, and I think that these, these tools now are, are very powerful in, in a similar way and can be terrific if used correctly, but also dangerous if, if abused. Well said, Jake. So, uh, so here for the for the last question here of the of this round, um, I wanted to 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 throw it over to to Toby and and uh, and Wesley. Perhaps starting with you, Toby, because we have we often on the show we talk about individual stock picks. We don't talk a lot about uh, ETF investing. So I wanted to ask you now that we have both of you here, what's the best and the worst thing that has happened uh, for retail ETF investors in recent years? Uh the the change from uh this is sort of a technical thing but the etfs had passive etfs had a capital gains tax advantage over active etfs that got removed in the last year so an active etf can now be run uh with the capital gains tax exemption which it's the main reason that you run an etf or one of the main reasons like it has this liquidity which is fantastic for investors that they can get in and out multiple times through the day if they want to. And uh, then the trades of the manager don't create capital gains tax implications for the person holding them. They make their own decisions about when they incur those capital gains tax. So I think that stuff is fantastic. It makes them, I think they're the best vehicles. I think that makes them better than mutual funds. They're better than LPs. They're better than um, managed accounts that from that perspective, they're, they're great. And I think that there's uh, the active change will see a lot more managers who had been in mutual funds or even managers who've been in LPs. And I know a few who are doing it, who are transitioning across into uh, uh, an ETF structure, which means that anybody would be able to get access to them where previously you needed to have some sort of like asset level, you know, to, to be in an LP that was going to charge you a carry, which a lot of these guys want to do, you need to be a an accredited investor, which is a, a they've just changed the the threshold recently, but it's it's like millions of dollars in investable assets, which most people don't have. But you'll be able to get access to managers through ETS, like Kathy Wood, you know, great manager. She's run it, run that portfolio really well, run it up, and there's fifty billion dollars worth of money invested with her. So all of, a lot of people have participated alongside her. I think that there are lots of value guys who are probably starting ETS now. That I think that there's one of them will have a, or a few of them will have a really good run over the next few decades and it, the average investor will be able to participate alongside them. So I think that that, even though that's a technical change, the practical implications of that are, are huge for, for uh, the average investor. As for the worst thing, it might be that there's all of this new competition coming in, in, uh, in value ETFs from these new managers who are, some of whom are going to do really well. And, uh, I like it as more of an exclusive club, selfishly. But you know, no, I'm I'm joking. But I don't, I don't, I think that I think there it's a great vehicle, and so uh, I think it's it's all good. Wes, anything really really bad happening to ETF investors over the yeah yeah? So I've been mean, the the forefront of this because we uh, I literally do three or four calls a day with people that want to launch ETFs now because because we're a manufacturing business where we help people get to market. So. And there is, to Toby's point, there are some amazing talents coming to market where normal in the old days that have been a hedge fund, tax inefficient, high fees. And now you're going to be able to access, you know, these great talents at low fees, global access, tax efficiently. Right. So it's amazing. ETF's great for investors. But to our prior conversation, what is so terrible about the ETF? Well, it's the same thing that's terrible about access is now you can trade it every day you can move in and out of it every day like it's that's the issue it's a behavioral problem so even though the investment opportunities and the cost to access them have came dramatically down it doesn't matter because people are going to screw it up by day trading the value managers now um i could just you know i start to feel like uh jack bogle here uh you know it's like the that guy was super smart man like People screw things up because they're people. Even you could, you know, bring the horse to water. They don't drink it. They just avoid your advice and, you know, go eat cyanide. I guess. Um, Maybe you guys could cite uh, the CGM's mutual funds results from 2000 to 2010 as a as an indicator of how how bad that behavioral friction is. 
Ken Hebner is fun. Yeah, that's Ken Hebner, yeah. Yeah. That's in quantitative value, isn't it? It was like the fund outperformed yeah. by That's why I'm teeing it up for you guys here. The, the fund was 18% a year and the average, the individual investor in it was 11% a year negative because the fund had that, the fund was volatile and had this gigantic run up at the end. And so most people just traded it the wrong way. When it was up, they sold it. When it was, sorry, the other way around, when it was up, they bought it. When it was down, they sold it yeah. and turned an 18% yeah. compound into 11% negative. Ben Johnson, I, I think he's one at Morningstar, has a cool study where they look at like over a 10-year period, like the best performing funds. And then they look at how like the Morningstar rankings and all that, that stuff go. And literally like the top performing funds, that usually it's the case that only two out of three years, they outperform the market. So they usually in a 10-year window, they have seven years of like egg on their face. But that, that's just, the, that's how it normally works. Like in order to outperform, you have to do crazy weird stuff and have horizon. If you don't, well, get back in line with every other idiot. But, and so there's just a trade-off. If you want to win and be the best over the long haul, you got to do weird stuff and it's got to be unique and you got to be ready for like the stats say, seven out of 10 years looking like an idiot. And, and that's not fun for a lot of people. Uh, it's just a fact of the marketplace. All right, Jen. So uh, this has been a this has been a great conversation. As as always, uh, we never have a chance to to hang out with you. Uh, before I let you go, I'd like to give all of you an opportunity to uh, let the audience know where they can learn more about you. Um, Wes. Uh, sure. Just alpharchitect.com, and if you want to launch an ETF, etfarchitect.com. Pretty simple. All right, Jake. Sure. My investment uh, shop is farnum-street.com. Uh, got a book, Rebel Allocator, on Amazon. Uh, do a kind of fun podcast with Toby every week uh, with our value after hours. Uh, and that's, yeah, just uh, say hi on, on uh, Twitter, farnumjake one or farnumjake1. And uh, not too hard to find. Although I should probably try to be harder to find. <laughs> JT undersells his book. He got Charlie Munger read jake's book and liked it so much he gave him a call he called him up and had a chat to him and he's he's trying to help him make it into a movie so uh if you haven't read that book you should go and read that it's a good book and you should uh come to uh acquirersmultiple.com which is my my website uh where the podcast that i do with jake is hosted and uh, you can you can hear him hear the man who spoke to charlie munger and hear what he has to say I run two funds. One is called the Acquirers Fund, ZIG. That's mid cap and large cap US equities, US value, deep value style, and uh, deep, which is small and micro. Um, same strategy, just in a in a different in a different universe with a little bit a little bit more diversification. Um, and I have I'm on Twitter at Greenbacked, G R E N B A C K D. Uh, I think that's it. Thanks, All Steve. Right. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, as always, make sure to follow us. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to subscribe. And gents, I guess I'll see you next quarter. Sounds good. Thanks, Dick. See you, fellas. See you, guys. See you. Look forward to it. Bye. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.